three or four or five. Test one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Test one, two, three. Test one, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Test one, two, three, four, five. Test one, two, three. Test one, two, three. Test one, two, three. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, am I good to go though? All right. All right. All right. No. Good afternoon. So, I'm Daniel Colson, and I'm going to talk about routing to each of any of your Docker containers. So if you have a home lab with a bunch of Docker containers, then you can use traffic to be able to use DNS names and route around to all of them. So I'm a, I've worked in IT security for about eight years, both on the sysadmin and security operations sides. Um, I'm also a rare Charlotte area native. Um, and I have a lot of services running in Docker containers on my home lab. So uh, I'm talking about how to use this traffic reverse proxy for getting to all of your containerized services. Um, we'll also look at applying certificates to uh, for HTTPS and adding middlewares to modify the network traffic as it goes through. Now, uh, this it is pronounced traffic, though I sometimes find myself saying it traffic or something, but the official pronunciation is traffic. Um, and the things you can do with traffic that I'll be talking about here are useful whether you just have a single server at home or with some modification, you can scale it up to more than that, so potentially enterprise. Uh, and I know there are much of enterprises that are using traffic at scale. Uh, and feel free to ask questions along the way. So here are a few network services that I'm running in Docker containers on my network. So I've got Home Assistant for home automation, Nextcloud for NAS and file management, MotionEye, uh, network home uh, IP cam surveillance, I'm using AdGuard Home currently as my network ad blocking solution, though I've used PyHole in the past as well. Um, I have Jellyfin as a media server, uh, server monitoring, wow, Uptime Kuma for monitoring my network, different services and network conditions, um, different network links and stuff. Found there's a tool called Scrutiny that regularly performs smart tests on your hard drives, which is useful for my NAS and we'll show the results as well as how important each of those if to each of the metrics that that test produce, produces is then i have curiosity who here runs at least one of these services at home okay yeah certain so at last count i have 23 services running in docker containers across two servers at my house so in, in fairness a couple of these are supporting services like databases or something that will support things like i think uh, nextcloud has one or two things like that, a, a database and maybe a queuing server or something. Um, so this large container habit means I would also have to remember almost 23 different port numbers for those services. And that's assuming one server. I have two. Um, so it gets more complicated with multiple ports on multiple servers. Um, I, I even put my network on a 10 dot star address range just to have less numbers to type um, when I started out. So actually. So yeah, you have stuff, stuff like 192.168.1.123, port 8080, 8081, 8123, whatever. But with traffic, you can add, you can use DNS and assign host names and subdomain names 
to each of your services and go directly to that without having to remember any of the numbers. Um, don't have to remember the ports. You do have to remember the name of the service, of course, but that's easier than IPs and ports. So I just mentioned look DNS. Let's take a quick look at that and how we'd set that up in a home lab type setup. So if you want to be able to route to multiple applications on the same host, you need the ability to add your own DNS records for the network, not just use the computer's network host names. So here's some examples of the DNS solutions you can use. Uh, I'm categorizing them as web UI or no web UI in this, not to like, point you toward or away from any of them, but to just give some idea of the variety are there. Um, for example, on the right side there, bind and unbound are used in some large enterprise environments. Um, and I think DNS mask is used under the hood by default in PyHole and maybe AdGuard Home. There are also some unofficial web UIs for those three options that don't have any here. Um, I'm mainly emphasizing this um, to show the need for a, some kind of DNS server cap capability beyond what your basic home router provides um, that allows you to add custom DNS records. If you're using a cloud-hosted server, uh, the hosting provider may have some DNS record management capability that you could use if you have a domain to point at it. Um, I'm personally using AdGuard Home currently as network blocking, as I mentioned, network ad blocking, as I mentioned, uh, and for its custom internal DNS capabilities. Um, if you don't want to set up local DNS, one option, that one option that comes up when you're looking for alternatives to that is using certain paths on one host to serve different applications. So looking like you know, myhost.lan slash nextcloud slash jellyfin, whatever you have. Uh, and traffic can definitely be configured for this. But unless the web app supports that, uh, specifically supports that and can be set to run from a specific path. Um, any URLs used for things like loading images from the server, navigation, stuff like that won't account for that extra path in the URL that you're giving it, and it's just going to fail. Um, theoretically, you could use some workarounds with URL rewrites uh, or something like that, but that gets really complex, and in general, I just really recommend not attempting that unless your application uh, specifically supports that. The other non-DNS option would be modifying your Etsy host file um, to add entries for the names that you want. Um, this works with any desktop operating system, though depending on what Linux distro you're, you're running, there may be some extra steps like restarting a local network service or on your system to get it to recognize the new entries. Um, I could be wrong, but there, I don't think there's really a good way to do this on mobile operating systems either. So um, It's fine for testing things, but I really recommend just setting up a a DNS server for your local network. Um, while my recommendation is to use a local DNS server, uh, when something goes wrong in the network, there's a joke about it always being DNS. So just remember that if something is going wrong on with your internet access or on your local network, remember that you're running a DNS server now, and that should be part of your troubleshooting. Um, a few months back, the morning after a power outage, I turned on my desktop and started to log into work, um, but the internet didn't seem to be working. After a few minutes, I remembered that I hadn't turned the server that was running my DNS back on. And now, our feature presentation. So let's, let's look back at uh, traffic now and how it works with Docker. Um, so since we're focusing on traffic right now and assuming some familiarity with Docker, uh, I'm not going for a full description of how containerization works. Um, but we'll quickly go through some terms here because some are relevant to the discussion with traffic. Uh, so, in short, Dockerfile describes how to build a, a Docker image, and that image can be used to run a container with whatever software has been baked into it in the build process. Uh, for volumes, if you're not familiar with bind mounting in Linux, it's not exclusive to Docker. Um, it's basically a method of mounting one location on the file system into another location, um, and in, th in this case, into an isolated Docker container, but there are other use cases as well for this feature. Uh, and lastly, the, uh, this part is essential for managing multiple Docker containers. Docker Compose. So this lets you define parameters to run the containers and easily create, start, stop, uh, and update and remove them. Which is especially helpful if you have lots of containers. So I can define all of my containers and the parameters for it um, and th into one file and then just start that back, start that up whenever. Uh, the main feature and reason I use traffic is the uh, dynamic configuration and service discovery features. So this can dynamically get configuration details and connect to backend services using data from Docker, Kubernetes, Amazon ECS, console, catalog, Marathon, or Rancher. Lots of different container and um, KV store services. Um, it can receive configuration only information from a YAML file or a key value store 
uh, like Redis or console, I guess, um, or a properly configured HTTP service. Um, there are also lots of different middleware features included by default. Um, you can perform actions on incoming requests with that um, between the process of receiving those requests and forwarding them to the service in the back end. Um, you can do things like include HTTP basic authentication, uh, change the HTTP header values, you know, URL rewrites, redirects, error, custom error pages, all kinds of stuff. Um, you can set up third-party middlewares as well. Uh, I've seen guides on how to integrate a third-party uh, single sign-on and two-factor authentication system called Othelia into traffic. So, um, and then service routing there is, is the ability to forward incoming requests to back-end services. This action is often referred to as being a reverse proxy. Um, and traffic, like most reverse proxies, can do load balancing between back-end servers as well. So just to define some traffic configuration terms now, entry points define a point or a port, and uh, whether that's TCP or UDP to listen to incoming traffic. Um, routers are rule sets for matching and determining which service that incoming request should go to. Um, and the middleware is also a router component and can modify or take actions on it on the request. Uh, service, a service definition tells traffic how to connect, connect to the backend service and providers is how to connect to the container or which one to use to connect to the container engine. So that's Docker, Kubernetes, ECS, whatever. And to visualize that process a little better, here's an image from the traffic documentation. So it shows an incoming request coming in, going to an entry point, and then the router uses rules to determine which service to send it to, and it sends through a middleware if needed. Um, and then the service there is the matching backend server that the request should go to. And so just to look at some alternatives here, to compare this with some of those that I've used in the past, like Nginx, HAProxy, and Caddy, these are all great tools. Um, they all can be considered reverse proxies. They do load balancing. Um, but the configuration discovery capabilities the, that, tr that traffic has puts this over these others for, um, in my opinion, for this use case. So I've put together an example traffic configuration using a Docker Compose file and a traffic YAML configuration file. I'm going to be going through those configuration files and showing the resulting uh, web interfaces. If you want to follow along or if you're unable to see the configuration file text on the screen from well from where you are, I've created a GitHub repo with the files there at this link. Uh, and I'll give you a few seconds to write that down if you want to. This is just a uh, Docker Compose file and the YAML uh, configuration file for traffic. Okay, so we'll go through the, the Docker Compose file first. So at the start of the top there, we'll define a service called traffic. I'll use the latest traffic Docker image, set a name for the container of traffic, or traffic example, I mean. We'll restart it automatically unless it gets stopped. Um, and traffic's base settings of what provider to use uh, can be configured with command arguments from a YAML file, um, sorry, command arguments in Docker Compose here, or as a YAML or in a, in a YAML file, or from a other methods that traffic supports. I'm going to show examples here of both command arguments and a YAML file. So we have a command item there uh, that enables the dashboard interface without a login. You can set this more secure, but this is an example. And I run it like this at home anyway, because it's an internal service, and is also a pretty much a view-only dashboard. You can't really make any changes. Um, Oh, and this also sets Docker as the uh, or providers Docker sets it pro Docker as the provider of backend service information. We'll set an environment variables for the time zone here next. Not necessarily required, but I think it's good practice, uh, and it's helpful when viewing logs from traffic to um, be certain that they're set in your time zone. So it makes it easier to figure out match up timestamps and stuff. Uh, I'm using a free dynamic DNS provider called DuckDNS for access in a few secured services externally. So I would include a token for that value for that here. Uh, and I've left this commented out um, because later I'll show how to configure automatic self-signed, um, both uh, self-signed and Let's Encrypt certificates. Uh, and DuckDNS is the DNS service that I've configured for using for that. I just left it in here for completeness for the example. But it's commented out, so it won't affect anything if you try and run this yourself. Next, we'll map the HTTP and HTTPS ports into the container. 
I've left the last port, left the last port mapping commented out just to show that while you can map a port for the traffic web dashboard, uh, it's not necessary because of the next part. So right now, it coming into this container, we only have port 80 and 443. So continu okay, continuing the Docker Compose configuration for traffic, um, we'll map the Docker socket onto our host into the traffic container, the volumes section, so the traffic can connect to Docker and read that service data from it about the containers. If you want to do this more securely, um, traffic so the traffic has access to read only the information that it explicitly needs, you can run a Docker proxy service, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more later um, to limit that. But yeah, this is an example, um, which is probably fine for most use home use cases. Um, it's up to you on how comfortable you are with that and how tightly you want to lock it down. Uh, then we'll, we'll map in the traffic YAML config file. And again, here's a commented out section for Let's Encrypt certificate storage that I'm including here just for example and completeness. The main way to configure Docker containers uh, for traffic is using label values on the containers. Uh, so first we'll define a router out of that labels section. We'll define a, um, we'll define a router of a rule that matches incoming requests looking for the name traffic.test.lan. Um, when I set up and tested this example at home, I used the DNS rewrite feature on my AdGuard home instance to point like star.test.lan to my desktop where I was running this. Um, so that's a, a wildcard DNS entry for anything.test.lan pointing to my desktop. So if you want to replicate this exactly, you need to set up a wildcard DNS entry like I did or individual DNS records for the um, traffic.test.lan and the other container names we'll be using here. And the last line here is to specify which port inside this container the request should be routed to. So um, traffic will by default use just the first exposed port from the container, but I like to specifically define it just in case. Um, just to be sure, and we have to specify it in this case since 8080 isn't the first exposed port from traffic. Uh, also notice on the previous slide we didn't map port 8080 into the in the traffic container to any port on the host, but traffic's routing will send matching requests to the port inside that container using that flow we talked about with bringing uh, incoming requests through the routers uh, and on through to the service in the back end, which in this case, the back end is the traffic dashboard on port 8080 inside the container. So the routing rule we just looked at used a host rule to match traffic.test.lan domain name or DNS, but there are others we can use to match uh, other ports of an incoming HTTP request. So we can match on header values and HTTP method, path in the URL, query parameters, or the client IP address. Um, we're going to be focusing on host rules for the examples I'm showing, but it is possible to use these others, uh, a couple other variants as well for using uh, regex matching on the host and uh, headers, I believe, um, if you need them. So with that, some other services to route to. So right, right now, before this, we just had traffic. So let's add another section in this Docker Compose file um, to route to. So this is a basic configuration for just an example web service container. Um, this will display a web page with the host name and some other information about the service. Um, notice we're not mapping any ports at all using like a ports section for this service. We're only defining two labels for traffic to use, which will match a certain host value and then send those requests to port 80 inside the container. So we've got hello1.test.lan and also port 80 there, the second label. Just to add a similar but differently named host, here's the same thing, but it's hello2, hello2 to test.lan, port 80 again, and the host name, container name, all that set to hello2. This is, the, this is hello3, which is mostly the same, but I've added some more labels for some more routers uh, and a middleware, when it, which enables TLS and an HTTP to HTTPS redirect. Uh, since that's a lot of text all together there in that labels, let's organize it for a better look. So these first, um, okay, we have two routers actually configured. One is for HTTP and has the name hello3-http. Hello uh, the name, the specific name isn't required. You can pick whatever you want. Just make it make sense for the, for the use case. Um, it matches requests coming in on the web entry point. Um, and we'll look at entry points that I've defined a little bit later in the, in the traffic configuration. Um, so we've got port 80 defined for that. And then we'll look at the, okay. 
And the third line of that first item um, gives the name of a middleware to use on matching requests. So we've got hello3-https for the middleware that we're going to apply to that route. And again, that's coming in on hello3.test.lan. For the next section here, this is a router matching the web secure entry point. So that's port 443, port 443 that are defined in the YAML config. We'll get to that in a second again. Um, we all also have the same hello3.test.lan host, and we've set TLS to true here uh, on that last, on that third line of the section. Um, I've not included the setting for a TLS certificate resolver here, um, so it's going to use a self-signed certificate generated by traffic, but you can add one um, that would use Let's Encrypt, for example. Um, so in the labels, that would be a, a setting for traffic.http dot routers dot hello three dot tls dot cert resolver and traffic has great documentation on how to construct that and this is that would be the name of, include the name of the resolver from the yaml config i've set it up this way to make the example sim simpler to replicate but my configuration at home does include the name of a let's encrypt certificate uh, resolver that I've defined in the yaml config to use with externally available services the middleware section there defines a middleware that directs redirects HTTP request to HTTPS. Um, I've used the same hello3-HTTPS name for this middleware here. Um, just to, yeah, because that's why that's I named it down here. So that's when I'm, the name I'm going to use for the middleware when I'm defining it in the router. Uh, and finally, we'll include a service port definition like the other services. So routing this to port 80 inside the container. And now we'll look at the traffic YAML configuration. So I split this into two columns, but it is the same file. Um, you can also define routers and services in the YAML configuration. Um, I'm not showing it here, but it is in the example that I put on GitHub. Um, for example, if you have a service running on a separate system that uh, maybe it's an appliance or something like that that you can't install Docker on, uh, Docker and traffic on, but you still want to use traffic's reverse proxy and middleware and other features on it, um, so you can define a router and service in the in traffic's YAML file, and it points to that. So going through these API, so this is the same command same as the command line option we specified in the Docker Compose file. Uh, we're just showing it here as well. For example, access log. <coughs> so this is telling traffic to log to the console when traffic or its services are accessed. So that's useful in debugging, and this is visible in the Docker logs command. Um, providers, we'll specify Docker as our configuration and service provider. Again, we did this in the Docker Compose, but I'm doing it here for completeness. Entry points, so here's the two entry points we were talking about, um, called Web and Web Secure for HTTP, HTTPS, with their associated ports. Certificates Resolver, Certificate Resolvers. So here I'll call, define a resolver called My Resolver. Uh, use the ACME protocol for Let's Encrypt, and you can set up a TLS challenge uh, HTTP or DNS challenge for Let's Encrypt to use in verifying your certificate requests. Um, the Duck DNS provider specified here is using that Duck DNS token from the Docker Compose. Um, and this section is commented out in the example YAML fi file since it's incomplete. There's no email address um, or token in there, but it's included for completeness again. And again, in my actual configuration at home, this is not commented and I'm actually using this. Uh, servers transport insecure skip verify. So if you have a service in a Docker container or a backend server that's running its own self-signed certificate in HTTPS, um, then this setting will tell traffic to not try and verify the certificate and you'll still be able to send traffic onto it. So let's run this example um, in screenshots. Um, we've gone over the configuration files for this, so let's see the results. Uh, I'm using the screenshots again, but I did verify that it was working while I was developing it, and that's how I took these screenshots. And this is available for you all to find in the GitHub repo if you want to try it yourself. Here's the traffic dashboard on traffic.test.lan. I've tried to zoom in a little bit there so you can see that in the URL bar. Now we can see the entry points we've defined, as well as the one traffic creates for its own dashboard, um, and a summary of the status of our routers, services, and middleware. Uh, as you can see, they're all green. Um, and if you scroll down below here on the dashboard, it shows if you have any uh, TCP or UDP routers, um, but since we don't have any in this example, that's all blank. So um, you can set up routers to handle HTTP traffic, which, which is what we're going to be focusing on here. 
but you can also route uh, plain TCP or UDP uh, coming into any of your defined entry points. So we'll click into the Explorer HTTP routers page. You can see the TLS status, uh, rules, entry points, service for each router that we've defined, as well as the ones that traffic is created by default for its own dashboard. Uh, and you can see on the right side there has like a different icon for whether it's from Docker or from traffic itself, like the top two are traffic and the rest are Docker. We'll click to the HTTP services at the top. Let's take a look at this. Um, you can see all the HTTP services that the routers on the previous page are pointing to, as well as the number of backend servers that it's load balancing. So on the second to right column there, it says there's zero or one. I think zero is just because it's internal to traffic, um, but the rest of those are one because there's one backend service for this. But you can load balance and have multiples. If we click over to middlewares, the third one is the HTTPS redirect we created for Hello3. The other two are internal ones created by traffic for his dashboard, again, um, and we can see by see that by the name and the traffic icon, traffic and Docker icons for the provider on the right there. So, from the configuration files we've looked at, we currently have four defined services. That's three Docker containers, uh, in addition to traffic running on an ex and the, yeah, three Docker containers running example HTTP services and also traffic. Um, traffic has read the configuration and routing the service rules we applied using the labels, and Hello3 should have an HTTPS redirect. So let's test out the other three services. So if we go to hello1.test.lan, uh, the, we can see the address ends in .2, and the server name says hello1. And then if we go to hello2.test.lan, that is also showing unique, has hello2 in the server name, has a different server address, and then Okay, let's try see if this video works of so browsing to hello to H hello three. We're gonna browse to hello three with HTTP and then redirect. That is not playing yet. I have a screenshot of the result too if this isn't working. There we go. Okay, so first we're gonna browse to I apologize if you can't see that, but um, we're going to browse to hello3 with just HTTP, and we'll get the certificate error there, and we'll take a look at the certificate. It's a self-signed certificate from traffic. We'll proceed anyway, and there's hello3 with HTTPS. Mm. There. So that's the result. Um, Final result, HTTPS, we have a different address, and the server name shows Hello3. So all these are working. So first, so let's talk about certificate transparency projects. Uh, now that we've looked at how to get automatic Let's Encrypt DLS certificates on your services, I caution you to use it strategically. Um, the certificate transparency project was created soon after the big push to get all the all web services using HTTPS, which is largely driven by Let's Encrypt and uh, their simple and free certificate setup. Um, when a lot more sites began to use HTTPS, um, threat actors who run phishing sites um, that impersonate legitimate services uh, found that everyone on the, to keep their websites looking believable, everyone had been trained, um, but they had to go to HTTPS as well because everyone had been trained to look for that little green lock and you know, HTTPS in the bar. So if they wanted to keep up and actually make, keep their sites looking somewhat legitimate, they had to have that too. So they started using services like Let's Encrypt too for their phishing sites. Um, and if I can remember right, there were also some issues around that time with certain somewhat sketchy certificate authorities not doing enough validation and maybe giving out certificates that they shouldn't have um, that potentially would have allowed bad actors to impersonate legitimate sites. Um, and so it improved transparency about what certificates were being generated and to keep certificate authorities accountable as well as detect bad actors using uh, TLS certificates, the Certificate Transparency Project was created. So they collect public TLS, SSL TLS certificates, and I think most of the public certificate authorities uh, participate in this now. Um, this is the same certificates that you can view in your browser that we just saw in that example. Um, I browse into Hello3. Same certificates that you can view in your browser when you go to a site with HTTPS. Uh, and they're available through various sites through s for search and analysis. 
Uh, this can be useful in detecting phishing sites as soon as they're created. Um, so if we saw similar domains like you know, southeastlinuxfest.org or southeastwindowsfest.org, um, very convincing sites like that, then something like that could be detected as soon as they register that certificate. Um, some of these sites that are listed here are like the uh, search stream one, useful in real time as a real time feed of certificates as they're added to the public record. Um, I personally like using CRT.sh for looking these up just because it's simple, fast. Here is the certificate transparency data about the certificate for southeastlinuxfest.org. Um, I'm sorry if that uh, text is very tiny, but uh, it's you can look that up as well for yourself on CRT.sh if you just search southeastlinuxfest.org. Uh, we can see that it's issued by Let's Encrypt and that it's not on any revocation lists for the major browser vendors. Um, this, this specific certificate that's showing was valid between March 8 and June 6 of this year. Um, of course, the site is now using an updated and valid certificate since I took the screenshot. But, uh, interestingly, while working on this presentation, uh, my wife got a phishing text message and she recognized it as phishing and showed it to me because of some funny spelling mistakes in it. Um, I looked up the I looked well. I looked up the domain which I've redacted here on the screenshot um, on CRT.sh, and I found several subdomains for it. So it looks like it's running the cPanel web management interface and a few other related services, um, likely on a web hosting provider that includes those features. Um, so this, this is an example of like if people have re registered uh, TLS certificates through this for all their subdomains, you can find this. So, to keep from giving away what services you're running to anyone who's looking, uh, don't use the full name of whatever service you're, you're using, maybe, um, or use a totally different or random name. So, um, if you're running Home Assistant, maybe something like ha.myserver.com instead of Home Assistant. Um, and you can find things like that on in the certificate transparency records. Um, or you can set up a wildcard certificate that will work for all your subdomains without specifying individual ones. Uh, you may have noticed in some of those past, uh, in some of the screenshots of the traffic dashboard, there was a button labeled connect with traffic pilot. And Traffic Labs, which is the organization that develops traffic, has a free cloud service called Traffic Pilot. Um, you can link your traffic service with it, uh, to it, and it will provide some metrics on requests and connections coming through your instances of traffic. You can also do basic health check alerting and security update notifications. Um, it can alert you via email or webhook if, uh, if your traffic instance loses connection to the internet for more than five minutes or something. Um, it can also send an alert if there's a security vulnerability that affects traffic that's discovered. The biggest feature of Traffic Pilot is plugins. Uh, this lets you add more middleware features to traffic, and these are open source. Anyone can develop and submit one on here. Uh, they're written in Go, like traffic itself. Um, and if you have one that you don't want to publish publicly, it is possible to package them uh, into a traffic installation directly. So you don't have to go through their cloud service. Um, but it makes it easier. So here's some examples of available plugins, things for modifying web pages as the request goes through, uh, adding authentication methods, blocking exploits, outsourcing security checks to mod security. Um, the containers on demand one at the top right is one I've been meaning to try out. This allows for only starting up containers when they're needed and then turning them back off uh, after a while so they're not using up any resources until you need them. So since security by obscurity shouldn't be your only method of security, some of the security measures I have for my home lab um, for internet facing services are li listed here. So I've got single, single ingress point through traffic, um, only 40 minimum points, ports possible. Um, one reason I'm using the DNS challenge for validation when getting Let's Encrypt certificates is because that method doesn't require having port 80 open. Um, my ingress port is a random high-numbered port. Um, I checked my traffic access logs for the previous week while writing this presentation. The only accesses that I wasn't sure were me were from a known public internet scan service called census.io, which I actually mentioned back in the certificate um, transparency section. Um, all web services coming in or that are accessible externally are using HTTPS, there's authentication, and they use a specific subdomain that you have to know to get in. A couple of these uh, methods here are very much security by obscurity. 
Um, so you shouldn't rely on these for complete security. Um, so for example, if someone really was targeting me, um, they could potentially use the certificate transparency records to find my subdomains. Um, but I have other security layers like authentication and intrusion protection methods that they'd have to get through as well. Um, and I have other security measures in place, but these are some of the precautions I take with my home lab. Um, the internet facing services I have, um, I've got Home Assistant, so I can use the app to remotely connect and control things. Um, Nextcloud for remote file access or sharing with other people. Um, it can also do automatic photo upload from, uh, from my phone, so anytime I take a picture, if I'm on Wi-Fi, it'll upload it back to my server uh, for backup. Uh, I've got WireGuard for, VM for connecting them into my network, and I run a Minecraft server uh, and a web-based map for it for a few friends. So for protecting your services with a bit stronger security, if you want this, uh, you can use a Docker socket proxy, which I mentioned earlier. This will reduce access to your Docker socket um, that traffic is connecting to, and this will uh, make it, you can have certain things read only or limit it to only parts of that Docker API that are needed for traffic or whatever other service you're using for that. Um, so in, in case of your traffic instance getting compromised, then it can't do anything to affect your other uh, Docker containers unless, it, unless there's a Docker escape. Um, you can also add middlewares for doing rate limiting, setting specific secure uh, TLS and HTTP header options. Um, you can do multi-factor authentication. We mentioned Othelia earlier with um, tutorials out there for integrating that with traffic. Um, there's ones for Google OAuth as well as, as a few others. Um, you can use a web application firewall like Mod Security, which we saw that there's a traffic plugin available for that. Um, fail to ban is an intrusion prevention method for blocking failed logins. Not really a um, web application firewall, more of just general intrusion prevention. Um, you could also use Cloudflare, which they have a free tier, and you could put your traffic server behind that and just only allow external connections from that cloud from Cloudflare there. And here's my GitHub link, including the link for the traffic example files again if you want those. I'm also on Matrix Chat, that address, and I'm in the Southeast Linux Fest Matrix room. And are there any questions? Um, for the question was about using a high numbered uh, random incoming port and I'd, I just say random just because I just picked a, a random port number and I use that as my incoming port that's the one port that I'm forwarding through to that server inside so yeah, yeah. you can pick whatever port you want it's, it doesn't change randomly I'm just I just picked it randomly yep you got 65,000 something ports to choose from, so pick something high. The low ones are all automatically scanned by various things on the internet. So on the uh, traffic uh, dashboard, is there any indicator on there that shows that the target services uh, live? It's, I believe so, because it was showing all green. Um, sorry. Yeah, for the, for the recording, the question was about if, the, if traffic's dashboard shows that if any services are down. I believe so, yes. If it can't contact the back-end service, um, then that will show red on there. So the question is about um, how does traffic differentiate between proxy and like HTTP versus Minecraft, TCP, or something like that between uh, on the same entry point? Is that what you're saying? Everything comes through uh, the defined the entry points that you defined. So you can have a Minecraft server running on port 20 or something if you want. Um, so 
Um, yes. Right. For HTTP entry points and inputs, you can differentiate that and split it out, as we saw with the host names and stuff like that. But for TCP uh, entry points, then you can, on, as the limitation, you can only have that going to one um, back-end service. So you have to have a, a port per um, for TCP or UDP, yeah. I think there may be some way to, to handle working around that that I saw in the latest traffic um, version, but I, I haven't looked into that very closely. Any other questions? Yeah, Cloudflare definitely seems to be a good option if you if you trust Cloudflare and you're willing to have their your traffic going through them, then they have a great product for that. It seems so. All right, well, thank you for coming. Yes, all of it was running in Docker.
Okay. <laughs> I don't know if you're old enough to remember his name. I've heard of him only because of the common name, but it's, it's not. We're not. Well, I haven't seen anybody else named Colson. So. Okay. <laughs>